Some of this stuff seems almost impossible. It's, yeah, I mean, I don't really know anybody that could do this. <laughs> That's this not is, possible. This is it? truly insane. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. This is How to Get Good at Sungazer. Let's go. This video is brought to you by Nebula Classes featuring Amy Nolte. Learn more at the end of the video. All right, sequence start. Oof. That was not meant to be played by a human. No. <laughs> <laughs> you did it. That was some high effort sequence start. Great job, guys. Like the piano intro wasn't designed to actually be played by anybody. We actually had a disclavier, which is a MIDI controlled piano, play it in the actual recording. Uh, so props to you for actually playing it. I think you're the first one. If I had to give critique, maybe play it faster. <laughs> play it faster. <laughs> and with drums. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Although I, I, like, I like the drums, but. Not everybody can play quintuplet swing like you can. <laughs> But uh, everyone can learn. Over at Sean Crowder's YouTube channel. Go check him out. Yeah, the, uh, the bass was like pretty spot on, right? The bass part is spot on, but it's interesting because you're using actually some different positions than I use. I typically actually will play a little bit more further down the neck. Um, you're really like covering the neck vertically this direction. I mean, that's the thing with like bass or guitar or anything. You can play all the notes in any number of different ways. Whatever's more economical for you. Honestly, this thing goes by so quickly that yeah. Just grab whatever you can. Uh, he certainly has a lot of uh, like shells and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Note for note. Meme zoom's on point as well. <laughs> Nice, killing. Yeah. yeah, note for note as well, like that whole intro solo. You improvised that. Right. What is it like to hear somebody play something that you improvised note for note? It's really strange, man. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's very flattering, but it's, it's odd. It's, it, it, I don't feel worthy of that. It's strange because you know that somebody spent so much time like copying yeah. your articulation and your sticking and everything note for note when it came out of you and you didn't think about it afterwards. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It's also that aspect of you're preparing a piece that was improvised. In other words, you're taking something that happened in the moment and now you're making that a fixed composition. It's it's cool. It's a unique experience, I think, to see somebody yeah, who yeah. has prepared your improvisation. Right, for sure. Yeah, I mean, absolutely as a way to learn, it's a fantastic tool, you know, to transcribe and or learn things that other people have played. Well, when you learn somebody else's improvisation, you're learning their vocabulary, mm -hmm. you're learning their manner of speech in a way. You know, another thing you can do, just for anyone watching that's transcribing things, is you can take little chunks of it, just a little one measure or even a one beat move on the instrument, and yep. you can create exercises out of that. In the ideal world, you want a lot of flexibility with your ideas. Right. You don't want to just only be able to play like one song all the way through, only in the exact way that it's written. I think that's the way to integrate things into your vocabulary. Vocabulary. <laughs> on a vocabulary. That's a yeah. hard word for me. It's a, vocabulary is a hard vocabulary word. <laughs> it really is. One 
to kill. I, I used two whole hands. Yeah, I love that. That was awesome. I, I mean, this tune is really interesting because it's kind of like a pop song, but it's mm -hmm. also in quintuplets. What about that like one-handed drum fill jumped out at you? Well, it's just it's just different than what I do. There's yeah. absolutely nothing wrong with doing it that way. The only limitation you might have is because of the tempo, you might be limited on how much volume and power you can get out of it. I mean, I'm not. I don't feel like it's lacking power here, so it's working just fine. But it's just an interesting thing to notice because when I play it, it's like da 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 or yeah. some you know alternating thing just to get you know more volume really. Also, it's a little bit of a contradiction because the ride bell is playing the exact same rhythm, but I do that with one hand. Aha! You know? Aha! The trick. So, <laughs> I mean, it's it's so fascinating too because like we're so intimately familiar with this music and like how we have to move to make the music and then to see somebody do something slightly different even mm. though it's the same music, it's like, whoa, Yeah, I don't do that. <laughs> Whereas totally. somebody like watching this will be like, yeah, it sounds exactly the same. Yeah, like, yeah. No, but it's different. He yeah, did yeah. this thing instead of this thing. <laughs> right, right, right. Ah! Yeah, so for drums, the room sound is at least half of the sound. Yeah, because like the tail of the sound will affect the clarity of the articulation, how many notes that you play, how the drums interact with the rest of the band and the rest of the mix. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's it might be difficult to get that kind of room sound because you might just, you know, the circumstances might be make it difficult, but just something to consider while you're playing is to really be listening to the sound of the room. Well, and also one reason for that may be that uh, it looks like it's just one mic here, overhead. Yeah. And so if you had close, uh, like at least a mic on the snare and or kick, you would get that more focused sound because it's pretty hard to get that tight sound from just the overheads. You can also do fun things like, I know Lewis Cole has an ear mic, meaning like he points mm -hmm. one microphone, it goes from behind his ear pointed like right at the snare and the kick. And there's a way of getting something that, like really tight compressed sound that way. So mm -hmm. there are ways of miking a drum set with just one mic that can sound good. It's just you need to have yeah. the right technique in the right room. It's, it's cool to hear this one as a cover because it's not the flashiest drum song. And nope. so people tend to cover the other ones because they want to, you know. They have they, more notes. It's nice to see one that's uh, like a groove based yeah. tune. So. Hey, real quick, just wanted to say that Sungazer is going on tour in September. We're going to be playing in Nashville, Memphis, St. Louis, Chicago, Cleveland, Toronto, Detroit, Indianapolis, Atlanta, DC, Hartford, Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. Come check us out. We also have some dates in Europe in November if you want to check us out then. And uh, yeah, back to the video. Okay. Oh, notes. <laughs> What's up? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 19 tuplet tapping, wow. Yeah, you should play the melody. Yeah, I could, I could do that. I don't <laughs> normally do that. That sounds kind of nice. Think of that. Yeah, well, he's playing your um, your kick 808 in the bass guitar, but normally we trigger the 808s with Sean's kick drum. You know, it's really interesting to see him do this because I'm using a very stock tapping pattern that mm -hmm. I've just like learned and used for basically everything where I'm using my index finger and my middle finger in the right hand and really just my index finger and usually my middle finger in this hand. Mm. It's kind of like yeah. one of these, it's like <laughs> a Django Reinhardt, like two fingers, just I, I know how to do this. <laughs> So you're using something slightly different, which is super cool to see. You're just using one finger in the right hand. Cool, I like the tone, I like the touch. Yeah, it's, it's not easy. Bad drum sound. Oh, snare. Sounds like it might be a pretty good deal. Yeah, yeah. The, the low volume. Yeah. I like that snare sound a lot. Yeah. <laughs> 
one of the things that we did on the original recording, the first two EPs, is we layered tons of samples on top of the kick and the snare just to give it more of like a... Electronic vibe. Yeah, and it, it's cool. I think this is the first time I've seen somebody do a similar thing where mm -hmm. they're layering. You, you can do this in Ableton Live and, and Lo I think Logic too, where you can take the MIDI data that's transferred from a kick and snare recording and then just put a sample on top of that and it sounds like... <laughs> 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 Nice! Every third quintuplet, the little, little details. I forgot about that fill, I never played that. <laughs> it's kinda cool. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, overall, really, really great. Occasionally, you can hear the timing get a little off of the recording. Whenever a drummer is playing along to a recording of drums, flams are a lot more noticeable than when a keyboard player is playing along to a keyboard yeah. recording of keyboards or a bass player to a bass. Like, there's something about the transients that just are really, really obvious when yeah. you are playing a drum transcription. So you have to be like perfect, or otherwise mm -hmm. Sean Crowder here will <laughs> roast you about your timing. <laughs> yeah. but actually, the groove felt really, really good to me. It's easy to to make that stuff feel a little too robotic or mechanical. This actually felt really good. It's just occasionally the time got away, especially in the fills, mm -hmm. you know. And that's very common. That's it happens to all of us, especially transitioning from a fill to a groove or yeah. vice versa. It's nothing that. We don't all face every day, so. Oh, oh yeah, especially, <laughs> especially me. <laughs> ah, okay, Maki, this is, this is a very, very specific drum. Yeah, I'm sure Sean will have some. Yeah, 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 right. have people figure out, yeah, what's the deal with this too? <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, so it's hard to hear by ear what's happening because I'm splitting up the limbs in kind of a, an unusual way. Mm -hmm. So rather than hands against feet, it's left side against right side, meaning, yeah, the left side's playing this ostinato or this loop, mm -hmm. and then the right side is improvising. Gotcha, and like the left hi-hat and stack are going the entire song, which yes. is kind of what he's doing. He's He like learned the stack and hi-hat thing, but it's not exactly what it is that you're doing because your concept is so like specifically embodied. There's no way that you would know that unless you're looking for it, unless you're trained to look for it. Like this is yeah. the kind of thing that I was not aware of until mm. Mike Mangini kind of clarified it for me when I was taking lessons with him. Yeah, yeah. You know, like I didn't even know it was possible to do this kind of thing. It wasn't until that switch was flipped in my head that I was able to pick out, oh, this is Virgil Donati doing that thing. Right, right. Otherwise, it's just like, wow. It's, what? Just, <laughs> it's just drums. Lots of drums yeah, are yeah, happening. Yeah. yeah. It goes to show how important vocabulary is to transcription, to being mm. able to hear something, and why a private teacher might be very useful for you, mm -hmm. because they will be able to get you to the point where you can hear things. Picking things up by ear is great alone, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's difficult to mm -hmm. actually concretely transfer the sound to the paper to your limbs. You have to have some kind of physical concept to make it work. If you want to learn more about this concept, I made a video specifically about Virgil Donati, who mm -hmm. is one of my favorites and one of my biggest influences as far as this coordination stuff goes. So there's a video about that on my channel. Go check it out. I like that font, it's <laughs> nice. So this is a MIDI realization of a drum line. So we've got the snare on the top line, tenor drums, also known as quads, on the second line, and then the bass drums on the bottom. And the bass drums are all played by individual human yes. beings. One drum per person. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. They are. They really are. Wow. We got some flams on the on the quads here. Dang. <laughs> I love this arrangement's amazing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So cool. 
minutes, so sure. <laughs> Wow, this is such a cool radio. makes me want to like do yeah. some marching percussion. Like I'm, uh, I had an EP called Time Motion Wine where I, I sampled some marching percussion and I think it works really nicely in like this electronic jazz setting because it's just like, I don't know, it's, it's so textured. It has such like a, a very particular vibe that's just not used that often and I think yeah. we could we could do some stuff with it, hopefully. It's, it's such a sound and for me personally, coming from a background of doing all this drumline stuff in yeah. high school, it's like, yeah, it's right up, right up, right up my alley so. I mean, the, the dream of having, like, Sungazer plus full drum corps would be amazing. This is really hard to play, though. Yeah, this, this, <laughs> this, some of this stuff seems almost impossible. It's, I, it's written within reason, you know, like, like it, it, it is theoretically, technically yes. this is possible, but, but like, who which, which, which I did appreciate, you know, it's like, yeah. this, this could be done with yeah. the right, you know, like, uh, Shout out to Blue Knights. I think maybe the Blue Knights could pull it off. Challenge for the Blue Knights. Can you pull this off? I don't think you can. I don't think you can pull this transcription off. Let's see it. <laughs> no ticks. There's something to be said about writing music that you know is musical. It is just at the threshold ha -ha, hey. of what is physically possible because that's something that can push yourself to be able to do more and more cool and adventurous things. And, you know, using technology like MIDI mockups to push what is possible in yourself. I, I, I do think it would be doable. And believe it or not, not, it's not the speed or technique that I think is the issue. Like mm -hmm. those bass splits, the 30 second note, I mean, people do that. So f I think yeah. uh, f coming from this drumline world, what's actually the most difficult thing would be this 1916 time signature and all these like weird tuplets that are yeah. happening within that. And particularly like there's tons of rolls, mm -hmm. uh, which have got to be super clean when there's 10 people playing percussion yeah. with like all the attack in the world and no sustain, you yeah. know, it's super obvious if you're off by just a little bit. So I think getting all that stuff clean would be the challenge here. Yeah, like, and uh, those sevens, like this is, uh, this 19 is broken up into six plus six plus seven. And then I noticed in a lot of those sevens, there were six tuplet rolls, yeah, yeah, so yeah. seven against six and right. getting 10 people to do that. Yeah. Uh, within the realm of possibility, but definitely, sure, yeah, definitely tricky. The attention to detail here is actually pretty nuts because, you know, all of the, these notes for the snare, for example, like moving in from... To front edge, to from center. From the edge to the center. To and gut all that, edge. Like, yeah, it makes it feel like this is a piece of music and not just an etude, although it, it kind of is like was written as an etude. Yeah. The stickings are all notated here. The crossovers on the quads, you know, where you're crossing your sticks, that's all notated. Yeah, I mean, I don't really know anybody that could do this. There's um, nobody on the internet. Nobody on the internet. Ever be able to do this. No drumline YouTubers or... There's nobody. It's, it's impossible. This is impossible to play, guys. You're welcome, by the way, for the B-roll footage of us saying that and then you playing it. Yeah, right, right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> how, how do you feel about having people cover your, your yeah, compositions? No, compositions. And, it's super interesting when people uh, add to them or like improvise their own melodies, or own, own things on top, because mm. it feels like much more alive, like a lived thing. I'm very excited to announce my dear friend and collaborator, Amy Nolte's new class, Creating mm. Strong Motifs for Jazz Improvisation, available exclusively on Nebula Classes. Amy's class is a fantastic, clear, and exciting look into jazz improvisation from the perspective of a true professional, and I know it will be a wonderful 
source of inspiration for you, no matter what your ability level might be. Sounds really good, doesn't it? It sure does, Amy, it sure does. Highly recommend this class. You can find this class exclusively on Nebula Classes, a brand new part of Nebula, the creator-owned streaming platform, where you can find top creators sharing their knowledge and experience with new classes every week. If you sign up, your subscription will also include Nebula, where you'll find all of my videos and over 10,000 others from over 150 creators, including dozens of high production originals and tons of exclusive content. If this sounds good to you, the whole thing is $10 a month or just $100 a year if you subscribe annually. And if you already have Nebula, upgrading to Nebula classes is just an extra $5 a month. By clicking the link in the description and subscribing to Nebula classes, you're not only supporting this channel, but all of the other wonderful creators, including Amy Nolte over on Nebula, as we create content that aims to engage the world in a more meaningful way. Thank you so much for watching. Peace.